Welcome to our webinar about IVF add-ons. I'm Anna McLeod, I'm the CEO of VARTA. And um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are gathering today. And I would like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this very important topic. Um, some of you have already submitted questions for our speakers. Um, thank you so much for that. And we are going to try to address all of those questions throughout the presentations tonight. However, if you actually have any additional questions throughout the presentations, um, you can certainly type them into your Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And then you can, um, we will actually try and endeavor to uh, respond to those at the end of the presentation when we have some um, Q&A open forum time. I would of course like to do the introductions. It is of course my great privilege um, to introduce you to our expert uh, speakers tonight. We have Dr. Sarah Lenson. She's an infertility and IVF researcher at the University of Melbourne. She is particularly interested in improving evidence-based healthcare for people seeking fertility treatment. She has been involved in a number of large clinical trials and systematic reviews, um, which evaluate infertility treatment options. And these have included um, interuterine insemination and the intermetrial scratching for IVF. She has a particular interest in IVF add-ons and her current research is focusing on the use of IVF add-ons in Australia. I'd also like to introduce you to Professor Cindy Farquhar. She's a leading gynecologist and obstetrician who's been involved in research examining IVF add-ons. Cindy is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Auckland. And she's also the clinical director of Fertility Plus and gynecology at the National Women's Auckland District Health Board. In 2020, Cindy was also appointed the Dean of Research and Policy at the Royal Australian um, and New Zealand College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. Now, both of our speakers are very familiar with the latest research about IVF add-ons. And so thank you once again for joining us. And I'll now hand over to Sarah to begin her presentation. Perfect, thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll be starting this presentation today about IVF add-ons. Um, thanks, Anna, for that kind introduction. You've summarised um, myself and Professor Farqua. I also just wanted to quickly um, mention in terms of our um, declarations of interest that Cindy and I have both received um, funding for our, for our research and salary from a number of um, governmental, hospital, um, public health and charitable foundations. And neither of us have any financial relationships uh, with IVF clinics or any commercial companies. Um, also, we wanted to just clarify right at the start that today we're going to be talking about IVF add-ons in terms of uh, the scientific evidence um, underlying them and other bits and pieces that people might like to think about when they're undergoing IVF. And what we're talking about today is not intended in any way to replace um, the clinical advice and guidance and counselling that you get from your um, fertility specialist or doctor. Okay, so what are IVF add-ons? Well, sometimes they're known as adjuvants or adjuncts or optional extras. And there's actually no established or agreed definition uh, for IVF add-ons in the IVF community. But when we talk about add-ons, we usually are talking about things that are optional or additional to standard IVF. So they're things that people use um, over and above what might be considered the core or necessary parts of IVF. Um, they're usually used with the claim or the hope that they might increase the chance of IVF success. And because they're usually um, optional extras, they, they normally come at, come at an extra cost to you, the patient. Um, having said all that, sometimes add-ons are also used routinely. So for example, at some clinics, Embryo Glue, um, which is an add-on we'll talk a bit more about um, later on in the presentation. Sometimes Embryo Glue is an optional extra that that patients can pay an additional amount for. And at other clinics, sometimes they use embryo glue for all embryo transfers. So there are sort of some gray areas um, in that sense. And when we talk about IVF add-ons, the sort of obvious ones that come to mind are those that are available at the IVF clinic. So these might be things that happen in the lab or medicines prescribed by, um, by your doctor or procedures that you might undergo. So 
can see in this um, in these diagrams on the right here at the top, we've got an example of uh, assisted or laser assisted hatching of an embryo, something that would happen in the laboratory. Um, this is an image of an endometrial scratch procedure that the doctor might perform in the clinic. And at the bottom, there's sort of a cartoon picture there of, um, of a cell being taken from an embryo for genetic testing. Um, but as well as these things that happen at the IVF clinic, um, add-ons can also include things that happen outside the clinic, things that might be alternative or complementary therapies. So something like acupuncture, Chinese herbal medicine, reflexology, any of these sorts of things that people are undergoing or seeking out to have alongside their IVF with the, with the, with the aim or the hope that they will improve or sort of confer some benefit to the IVF process. They could be considered add-ons and even things that are, um, you know, nutritional supplements like vitamins or I've heard of um, people having access to um, fertility boosting um, fruit juices or shakes, anything like that can also be considered an add-on. So I know it's quite complicated, so I just wanted to kind of hammer the point um, about a few of the things to sort of distinguish between when things are and aren't add-ons. So ICSI, um, which is uh, sometimes used for IVF when the sperm is injected into the egg um, in attempts to fertilize it. If this is used in the case of male factor where there's um, some problem with the sperm and, and, and this sort of injection is deemed necessary to enable fertilization, then we wouldn't normally consider that to be an add-on. But when ICSI is used for non-male infertility, so there's no sort of reason to think that fertilization is going to be a problem. If ICSI sort of offered um, in that case, then we might consider that ICSI to be an add-on in that circumstance. Um, genetic testing, when this is used for inheritable conditions, so when um, the male or the female is aware of a condition that they, they carry or they might carry and they're worried about passing that on to their offspring, and so the embryos are tested for that sort of specific genetic condition, then we wouldn't consider that to be an add-on. But when um, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or PGTA is undertaken, that's a genetic testing of the embryos used to detect um, embryos where the, the cells have the wrong number of chromosomes. Um, we would normally consider that to be an add-on. Endometrial biopsy, that's actually a procedure that often happens in the gynecology clinic if uh, the doctor sort of suspects or worries that there might be some pathology or some problem in the endometrium and they want to do a biopsy to take that sample and send it away for testing. If that's the reason the procedure is done, we wouldn't consider it to be an add-on. Whereas when that very same procedure is done, you know, at a specific time um, alongside an IVF cycle, and maybe it's being called an endometrial scratch or endometrial injury, um, and, and the aim of doing the procedure is to create some disruption in the lining which might help the embryo to implant, then we would consider that to be an add-on. And at the bottom there, time lapse, um, that's a um, special type of incubator used in the lab laboratory um, where the embryos can be continuously kept in the incubator, they don't need to be taken in and out uh, for monitoring. I put this one in italics because I think it's really um, illustrates the kind of gray areas here. But when time lapse incubators are used because the embryologists want to use them, maybe they improve their workflow or, or they um, find them to be an easier incubator to use. We wouldn't necessarily consider that to be an add on because they do need to use some sort of incubator at the end of the day. Whereas if the clinic is sort of offering the time lapse incubator to some patients and um, it costs extra to use that incubator at the clinic and maybe they're saying if you use this incubator you'll be giving yourself the best chance of having the, having the best quality embryo then we would consider that to be an add-on. So I hope that sort of um, clarified what what we're talking about today before we get into it uh, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, add-on use in Australia so this is a um, the title of a research paper that our um, research group published uh, just this month or last month, um, and we did a survey of women who'd have, uh, who have had IVF in Australia in the last three years, and we essentially asked them, you know, during your IVF treatment in the last three years, did you use any add-ons? Um, and we received almost 1,600 responses to our survey, and overall, 
sort of major finding was that 82 percent of women had used at least one add-on and on average they'd used two so it just does show that add-on use is quite common um, at least in Australia and the add-ons are usually costing costing patients extra and this is a table of the results sort of broken down by add-on and the add-ons are, are listed here in the order of how frequently they were used so at the top, the first row um, is acupuncture. So acupuncture, you can see, was used by 45% of uh, women who, who filled in our survey. And the next two most common were PGTA, that's the genetic testing for aneuploidy, and Chinese herbal medicine. And just a little bit about um, the add-ons in Victoria. So VARTA, who's the um, group who put on this um, seminar for us this evening, they're the state regulator for IVF in the state of Victoria. And in terms of add-ons, um, BARTA requires IVF clinics to make sure that the clinics are, are providing their patients with uh, adequate information about the evidence, benefits and risks of add-ons. And they also ask the clinics to notify them, to notify BARTA of any new treatments or procedures, including add-ons that they are offering at their clinic. And VARTA also has important roles in monitoring and reviewing the evidence that's coming out from studies about add-ons and putting information on their website that it's accessible to the public um, about add-ons. But I think importantly um, for, you to, for you to know is that VARTA cannot control uh, which add-ons are made available to patients or prohibit their use. So um, when an IVF clinic tells VARTA, we're thinking, you know, we're planning to start using this new add-on next month. VARTA can't tell them, no, we don't think you should. We don't, you know, we don't think that there's enough evidence that that's effective or safe, or you know, we think you're charging too much for that add-on. They can't um, control any of those aspects. So just for you to know that um, when you're seeing a clinic's offering a new add-on, don't think um, it's probably been through some sort of regulatory process for them to be allowed to, to use this add-on. That's not the case. The clinics are sort of um, able to make their own decisions about which add-ons they use. Okay, so for the rest of the talk um, this evening, we're going to be um, using this framework of evidence-based medicine or EBM. Um, and that's a, a concept that um, all doctors um, try and use in their medical practice to make sure that they're using or applying these three domains um, to the way that they treat their patients. So the first domain is the clinical judgment there in yellow. And that's about um, the doctor having, having gone to med school and through all their training and their years of experience, the wealth of knowledge they sort of bring to the table in their um, helping patients or making uh, uh, healthcare um, decisions for their patients. And we're not really going to talk about that domain this afternoon because um, we're not able to. That's something that the individual doctors um, bring to the table. The second domain in red here is about relevant scientific evidence. So the, the doctors should be thinking about um, applying scientific evidence from research studies when they're um, treating their patients. And that's something we're going to talk about today. And generally, when we talk about um, scientific evidence, we're interested mostly in randomized controlled trials and the systematic reviews that include them. And we'll talk about both of these types of um, study shortly. Um, but essentially, the randomized controlled trial is the, is the best and most reliable way to answer the question of whether a new um, or any kind of um, healthcare intervention is effective and safe. So in the context of add-ons we're talking about this evening, randomized controlled trials can answer the question of does this add-on increase the chance of having a baby or increase live birth rates? And is this add-on safe? Does this add-on carry any risk to me or to a pregnancy that might uh, result from fertility treatment? So we're going to be talking a bit about scientific evidence or a lot about the scientific evidence today. And then the third domain, the blue one there at the bottom is about you guys, the patients, and um, your beliefs, your values, your preferences, um, you're, you're a sort of a third um, important part of these three domains that um, are, are equally important for evidence-based medicine, making sure that you're sort of overlaying your values on, onto the healthcare decision so that 
you're making a decision that's right for you personally. So we'll be talking a little bit about this in, in terms of shared decision making, you and the doctor both being involved in the decision and um, informed consent. So I'll start with the scientific evidence. So this um, little triangle here is called um, a hierarchy of evidence and it's something that we talk a lot about in um, scientific um, sort of study methodology but all you really need to worry about is at the top there in the hierarchy the top two types of study are randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews. So randomized controlled trials or sometimes we call them RCTs you, you've probably heard of them before um, they're generally considered to be the gold standard way um, to test healthcare interventions. So, for example, um, with the COVID um, vaccines that have been tested recently, they're being tested in RCTs. Um, whenever the FDA wants to um, make a decision about whether they're going to approve a new, a new drug for cancer or something like that, they're going to want data from RCTs because it's the most reliable, robust way to measure whether an intervention works or not. And really, um, what makes randomized controlled trials so special is really quite simple. It's just that for every individual person who's taking part in the study, whether they receive the new intervention or the control is random. So it's like flipping a coin, heads you get the intervention, uh, tails you get the control. So I'm just going to play a little video, um, hopefully it works, to just um, quickly describe what randomized trials are and how they're so powerful. A randomized trial is a way of testing new treatments without bias. Dr. Brown develops a new cancer treatment that she thinks is as good, if not better, than the current treatment. To find out if it is better, she needs to test it. The new treatment is called Treatment A, and the current treatment, Treatment B. She asks people with cancer to take part in a trial to compare the treatments, and gives one group the new treatment and the other the current treatment. To make sure there is no bias, the groups need to be as similar as possible. So, the groups need to have a similar age range of people, they need to have similar general health, and to have had similar treatments. If the two groups are too different, it might affect the results. Also, neither Dr. Brown nor the patients can choose which treatment they have. If Dr. Brown chose, she may subconsciously put the sicker patients into the current treatment group and give the new treatment to the fitter people, making the new treatment look as if it worked better when it really didn't. So to prevent bias, Dr. Brown puts the details of those taking part into a special computer program and that randomly allocates them to either treatment A or treatment B. This means that the people taking part in the trial have treatments that are suitable for them and that will help the doctor to find out if the new treatment works better than the current one. Okay, great. So um, I just wanted to put this up as an example of a sort of cautionary tale of why um, randomized controlled trials are so important. So there's an add-on um, out there called the endometrial receptivity array or the error test. You might have um, heard of it before, or um, maybe some of you um, on the call have even um, had this add-on before, but basically um, it involves taking a biopsy from the lining of the womb that's then sort of sent away to a laboratory to be processed through a complicated um, sort of laboratory test. And the result of that test tells the, the doctor or the embryologist um, when to put the embryo back for each individual woman based on their biopsy. Um, and so this sounds like a really exciting concept and it sounds like it um, is sort of biologically plausible. And based on this and some data from observational studies, so studies that were not randomized, um, the test looked, uh, looked like it might work. And so the company released it and it's been used by thousands of women around the world. 
and then the company published the um, the first randomized controlled control trial on this test just last year. And the results of that study found there was no benefit or no evidence of benefit in terms of improving the live birth rate. So whether a woman had the error test or not, they had a very similar chance of having a baby from IVF. So it's just um, sort of goes to show why we do need um, to lean on randomized controlled trials when we're looking at evidence. And now I'm going to hand over to um, my colleague, Professor Cindy Farquhar, to talk to us about systematic reviews. Okay, so thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, um, uh, Sarah, for, for doing the first part of the lecture. Um, I'm going to explain just briefly about systematic reviews. So Sarah's mentioned about single studies of uh, randomized controlled trials, and systematic reviews are really bringing together all of the studies on a given topic, uh, uh, mostly in randomized control trials. So it um, allows us to talk about having a body of evidence. And so what we do with the systematic review is, um, I'm over here on this side of the, on the right-hand side here. Um, we, we have a plan for the review, we search for the studies and then extract data, assess the quality, combine the data um, using a statistical method called meta-analysis, and then discuss and conclude the overall findings. And the overall output is called um, a systematic review. And it's because things are done systematically while um, this review is undertaken. And I think the beauty of a systematic review is it allows you to go and find all of the um, high quality evidence on a particular topic uh, in one place, instead of having to go and uh, look at the studies individually. Uh, next slide, please. So the Cochrane um, Library is an online journal of uh, systematic reviews. Um, it's uh, named after a particular epidemiologist, Archie Cochrane, uh, and they um, consider, or we consider, um, I'm a Cochrane author myself and editor, uh, that the, um, the highest quality uh, reviews are produced. And that's because we use this um, robust methodology and we assess for reliable results, assessing the quality of the studies. Uh, there's, um, they're ind we're independent with no funding from the commercial companies. In Australia and in New Zealand, um, there's free access to the Cochrane Library from any computer in the, in the country, whether you're in your coffee shop or at home or at work. Uh, we, and they have plain la language summaries, which I'm about to show you, and also an IVF add-on special collection. Next slide, please. So this is the opening page of the Cochrane Library. And um, you can see there are a number of things along the top here, Cochrane reviews, et cetera. But I just want you to come over to the right-hand side here, uh, and you can put in your uh, topic there. And Sarah's um, usefully put in the topic of acupuncture. Uh, which was the most common add-on being used in Australia uh, when she did her survey. And um, you put that in and then um, uh, do the search. And Sarah, can we turn to the next slide, please? <clears throat> and you will find a Cochrane review on acupuncture and assisted reproductive technology. Now, there's a lot of information in this review, but if you just want to read um, uh, the two places to go, just to read a summary, would be the abstract or the plain language summary. And we'll go to the plain language summary now. Next slide, please. And you'll see that, <clears throat> um, that you have the review question there. Very simple. Does acupuncture improve the outcomes of assisted reproduction? A little bit of information about the background, um, the um, dates of the search, uh, the char study characteristics, and then if we could just Click the next slide, uh, the next button, please, Sarah. <clears throat> and here are the key results where it says there's no evidence of benefit for the use of acupuncture in participants undergoing assisted conception treatment around the time of embryo transfer or egg collection. And also no evidence that there was any um, effect on miscarriage um, or had significant side effects. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned uh, that Cochrane has a special collection for IVF add-ons, and um, you can uh, search on that in the library, and this should come up. And they've been grouped as laboratory add-ons, clinical add-ons, 
and add-ons for the endometrium. Next slide, please. So the, um, there's also this traffic light system, which comes from the Human Fertilization and Embryo Embryology Authority, HFEA, uh, which is a UK-based um, authority uh, with a very similar role to VATA. Um, and they've come up with um, a traffic light system, which is fairly obvious there, uh, green, orange, and red. And um, this also will help people when they're making decisions about um, add-ons. And I think it would be interesting for you to know that there's not a single add-on in the HFEA system that gets a green light. Next slide, please. So here's the um, <clears throat> uh, summary for endometrial scratching, which has an orange um, uh, light here. And it's considered to be um, uh, uh, an, if, uh, uh, an example of um, conflicting evidence. And so I think that's very helpful for people making a decision. Next slide, please. So we're just going to briefly look at some of the common IVF add-ons. Next slide, please. Uh, and the first one, Sarah's already mentioned this a couple of times, time-lapse uh, uh, time imaging, or also known as the embryoscope. And this allows for the uh, continuous uninterrupted incubation of embryos, um, improving the environment because you're not disturbing them for assessment. And also they have computer algorithms that help um, uh, pick the best embryo. And this has been offered by 33% of IVF clinics in Australia and used in the survey that Sarah mentioned, used by 22%. So nearly one in four patients using this. And they've been charged um, about 27% uh, tw of the time. So that's an additional charge. And it varies from clinic to clinic how much they might charge, but it's usually somewhere between $500 and $1,000 per cycle. Next slide, please. Uh, so this has been summarized in the Cochrane um, Systematic Review. Um, there were nine, nine studies and there was no evidence of any difference in live birth rates, pregnancy rates and miscarriage rates. And this has been given an amber by the HFEA. And I do know that further studies are underway um, in the UK and should be reporting a, um, uh, in, the, in the next 12 months or so. Next slide, please. And then there's another technique which you may have been offered or heard of called IMSI, where um, the sperm uh, for, for, during an ICSI cycle, which you've heard about already, uh, sperm are normally viewed under a microscope and selected based on their morphology. And IMSI provides a much higher um, magnification, 6,000 times higher, and has been offered by 23% of IVF clinics in Australia. According, that's according to a website search. And um, only 6% of IVF patients are taking this up and it costs, uh, generally they're charged an additional amount about half the time. Next slide, please. And a Cochrane review on this topic, 13 RCTs and no evidence of a difference in live birth rates, pregnancy rates or miscarriage rates. And the HFEA have given this one a, um, a red light. Next slide, please. And uh, then we have the example of embryo glue, uh, which is hyaluronic acid in the embryo transfer medium. It's a natural compound and it acts as a binding agent and also considered to be protective. And it's often added to the embryo transfer media with the aim of helping to implant the embryo. And this is offered 23% uh, of the clinics in Australia are offering this and used by 22% of IVF patients and about 60% of the time that comes with an additional charge. Next slide, please. And this Cochrane review on this topic and um, updated uh, last year, 26 RCTs. And this is an example where the embryo glue is thought to increase uh, live birth rates uh, and also pregnancy rates. And so this one has been given an amber by the um, HFEA. And the reason it's been given an amber is that some of the studies um, uh, that reported pregnancy rates didn't also report their live birth rates. And uh, so there was this concern that only the positive studies had bothered to um, publish those 
rates. And I'm going to hand back to um, Dr. Linson now. Great, thanks, Cindy. Um, hopefully I'm back for everyone. Um, so that was a bit about um, the evidence from RCTs and um, how you can access that from Cochrane Reviews and the HFEA website. But we often are in the situation um, where there's conflicting evidence or very little evidence or even sometimes no evidence in terms of randomized controlled trials. And I think it's, um, well, I sort of often hear people say, I know that there's no evidence, but maybe there's just no evidence yet. And if you did the study um, and it was published tomorrow, maybe we'd find that this add-on sort of doubles your chance of um, having a baby. And if you haven't tested it yet, you don't know that it doesn't work. Um, and while that is possibly true, I think it's, um, you know, it's really tempting to, to sort of hope that um, these untested things offer some benefit, but we need to remember that if we haven't run a randomized controlled trial um, and we don't have good evidence, then we don't know that the add-on might not actually reduce your chance of um, conceiving or be unsafe or have some other kind of unintended side effect or consequence um, that we don't know because we haven't, we haven't tested it. Um, and the other thing is that the add-on might be really expensive. So sometimes they, they might cost you so much that you regret um, paying for it, or um, it's chewed up um, so much of your money that you can't afford another IVF cycle if you need one. So that's just a point about um, the situation where there's no evidence. And then just quickly about anecdotal evidence. So this is um, sort of sort of anecdotes that we might hear from friends or family or from um, online forums, or maybe when you're talking to your hairdresser, they say, um, you know, the, hair, the hairdresser's sister used a certain add-on and they got pregnant. And sometimes it can be really tempting to, um, to grab onto those sorts of anecdotes um, and to think that that counts as some kind of evidence. And especially if you, if you might think that your circumstances are really similar to um, that person and to think if it worked for them, you know, maybe it's the magic bullet and it might be the thing that I need. Um, so just a few points on these anecdotes is that people are much more likely in general to share experiences that are either, you know, really positive or really negative. So um, if someone has a really good experience, they might feel like they've got to jump online, they've got to tell everyone about this, they've got to make sure everyone goes and uses um, this treatment option if they believe it worked for them, even if um, that wasn't the, the reason that they fell pregnant. Or people might share really negative views if they really want to warn everyone against, um, you know, using a doctor they had a bad experience with or using a treatment that they think caused them some harm. So just when you're looking at um, these sorts of messages on, on, on forums or talking to other people, just know that you're often you're only sort of getting these extreme views and you're not getting any of the neutral comments. And so what you're looking at is a really sort of skewed or biased um, view of um, people's experiences. And people also really tend to overlook the fact that something might just be a coincidence and they might try and attribute their success or their failure to something specific that they did at that time, when really that thing might have nothing to do with it. Um, so, for example, the chance of um, having a baby from IVF um, for every cycle started in Australia, if you look at the data from the national report, is about one in six. Um, so the chances of, of having a baby from an IVF cycle on average is about one in six, the same as rolling a six on a dice. Um, so if you think of it more like that, more of a numbers game of trying to roll a six, um, rather than thinking... Um, you know, if you ate, ate a banana before you rolled the six, that maybe that's the thing that helps you um, roll the six. It's nothing to do with the banana. It's just the fact that you might need to roll the, uh, roll the dice over and over again. Um, so for these sorts of reasons, just be really careful with anecdotal accounts um, and don't think of them as being evidence. What they can be useful for is um, understanding the patient experience. So if people are talking about where you can get certain treatments or tests done, how much they cost, how long the waiting list is, if something hurts or not, um, those sorts of things aren't about the evidence. They're not about effectiveness or safety of, of a treatment option. So anecdotes can be used for that. And they can be used for helping you think of things that you can then go, go along and talk to your doctor about, but don't think of them as being evidence in, on their own. Okay, so we've been talking about scientific evidence a lot, and now we're moving on to that blue 
domain of evidence-based medicine, which is the patients, you guys, um, which we'll just touch on briefly. Um, so one um, way to help sort of empower you to think about your options and to have constructed conversations with your, your doctor or other staff at the IVF clinic are these five questions that have been generated by Choosing Wisely. And Choosing Wisely is a, a campaign um, backed by the government that's sort of aiming to try and reduce across all aspects of healthcare, not just uh, IVF, trying to reduce unnecessary tests, treatments and procedures in Australia. And they've, re they've produced these five questions that they sort of suggest that patients might even take along to their consultations just to help them ask, ask these questions so they get all the information. So the first one is, do I really need this treatment or procedure? Secondly, what are the risks? Thirdly, are there alternative options which might be simpler uh, and or safer? What happens if I don't do anything? And of course, what is the cost or what are the costs? So um, this is something that you might like to think about um, when, you're, when you're thinking about add-ons and talking to your doctor. Um, the next slide is just some quotes from uh, people who have had um, fertility treatment and quotes that have come out of research we've done at the University of Melbourne and also from the UK um, that are just put up there to try and um, help you think about what which of these sentiments sort of resonate with you um, and kind of trying to think about the, the possible um, difference when you're making a treatment decision about how you'll feel afterwards um, with your when you've made your, your treatment decision and you don't fall pregnant um, whether you regret the decision or whether you're satisfied with the decision and those are kind of like polar um, ends of the spectrum but just trying to help you think these things through so the first quote um, that someone said is there's no proof of success, but it's a peace of mind thing, having tried um, the add-on. So that's sort of someone who feels satisfied that they're trying something despite there being no evidence. And on the flip side, um, someone in our, one of our studies said, I feel we were unfairly made to purchase add-ons that did not give us any extra chance. They just left us out of pocket. So that person maybe is feeling more um, regretful. This person says, many years and finally a baby, the best choice I ever made was not to give up and to try all the extras. That's one experience. And then on the flip side, someone who says, for me personally, it's made zero difference so far. My very first cycle, my husband and I use no vitamins, no add-ons, and they have a son from that cycle. Every subsequent cycle we've used add-ons and we have no, we have so far had no success, sadly. Uh, this quote from someone in the UK who says they told me that what the scratch was and how it could be beneficial. So at that point, it's like it's only an extra 250 pounds. We might as well. If it doesn't work, we're going to think if the IVF doesn't work, we're going to think, well, what if I had only just spent that 250 extra pounds? And then again, on the flip side, someone who says when a doctor mentions something as being experimental, in this case, testosterone, you immediately think it might give you an edge and be the thing that does the trick. But I now think that my rational mind was compromised during that time and the testosterone was no more likely to help me than eating an orange or standing on my head. So these quotes are just sort of, like I said, um, put up there to help you just sort of see whether, whether any of them resonate with you and just to kind of help you think, um, especially if um, you don't fall pregnant um, after the cycle, how will you feel if you decided to use this um, add-on and how will you feel if you decided not to? just to help you um, in making this decision and thinking about um, your own personal view. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, when you make these healthcare decisions, you, you should be making something called um, an informed decision or, or giving an informed consent. Um, and the FSA, the Fertility Society for Australia, they released some uh, recommendation recently to IVF clinics um, in Australia and New Zealand recommending that uh, patients should provide written informed consent for all use of um, add-ons. So when you're at the IVF clinic, um, don't feel like you're being a nuisance or something for demand or for, for asking questions and trying to make sure you're making an informed decision because the IVF clinics have been told that patients should be providing not just informed consent, but written informed consent for using add-ons. So what does that mean? Well, it means that as the patient, you have received accurate and relevant information about the proposed intervention, the add-on, 
you've had a chance to learn about alternative options that you might consider. You understand the benefits and risks and you've had a chance to ask questions to make sure that all the things that are important to you, you've had a chance to ask questions um, and to think them through before you make a decision. Okay, so um, this is the final slide. Um, just to summarize what we've covered is that there are many different add-ons that are available in Australia, but not very many are supported by good scientific evidence that they're effective, that they'll help you to have a baby and that they're safe. If you're interested in um, seeking trusted information um, about whether add-ons um, uh, are effective and safe, the best type of study uh, you should be looking for is a randomized controlled trial. And of course, Cochrane reviews, which, which have sort of summarized all these trials together, or the HFEA website are great resources to go to. And don't forget to think about what's important to you personally. How, how much um, do you care about the reliability or the strength of the evidence? What about the risks? You know, what about the cost? Have you weighed up whether um, you do want to pay extra for that add-on or if you might be better to save that money in case you need, need further fertility treatment and how will you feel afterwards in terms of where you might sit on that sort of regret satisfaction continuum. And just before um, I hand back to Anna, I just wanted to make a quick plug for our research um, at the university. So we've set up something called the research panel and we're um, asking people who have any experience of infertility, IVF, egg freezing, anything like that, who are interested in taking part in research or helping us to develop um, research studies, if they'd like to sign up to our panel and then they'll be contacted um, periodically with opportunities to take part in our research. Maybe it's a survey or an interview or to, to help us to um, develop our um, develop our project. So if you're interested, there's the QR code on the screen, or you can send us an email at fertility research panel at UniMail. And secondly, we talked about the HFEA um, traffic light system, and that's a UK based um, system that the, the regulator in the UK runs. And we don't have anything um, sort of equivalent here in Australia, but we've recently received a grant, a, um, a research grant to develop something. And we'd be really interested to hear from patients in terms of um, anything that might pop to your mind right now about um, things that you hope we include on the website or things you, you think um, are important or not important. Or if you'd like to have um, more involvement, we're, we're keen to involve patients in the development and the testing of it over time. So please send me an email at sarah.lenson at unimalb.edu.au if you're interested in that. All right. Thanks very much. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much, Sarah and Cindy, for such an informative presentation. That's been wonderful. It actually now brings us uh, to our Q&A section of the night. So we're looking forward to um, questions coming through. Um, however, joining us in the panel, uh, we're going to open it up to another obstetrician and gynecologist, Associate Professor Peter Luton. He is a fertility subspecialist. So welcome, Peter, to, um, to the panel. And in actual fact, I thought given um, Sarah and Cindy have already had an opportunity to talk tonight, I thought I might start with you, Peter, with the first question. So Peter, how widespread is the use of add-ons, um, add-on therapies in fertility treatment um, in, in your experience? And why do you think this is so? I think uh, Sarah's study uh, that she presented in her slides earlier are probably our best indicator. Uh, of the incidence of um, add-ons uh, in fertility treatment in Australia. And that was, you know, around approximately 80% 80, 80 uh, of all cycles having some form of add-on. So the incidence is, um, you know, very high. Obviously, mm -hmm. the type of treatment, the costs involved, the risk involved uh, will vary uh, with those treatments. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's a very high incidence. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I want to open a question up to um, Sarah and Cindy, given, um, you know, the breadth of your research was across Australia. Obviously, VARTA plays a role in regulating in Victoria. I was quite interested if you would be able to share, um, really, in regulating IVF add-ons, what happens in other states and territories in Australia? Sure. So. Um... 
<laughs> I, as far as I know, it is quite um, sparse. Like BATA has probably some of the strongest regulation in Australia, as far as I'm aware. Um, and some states have um, have smaller regulators or, or less regulation. But maybe Cindy, you know more than me. Uh, no, I think you're right about that. Um, I, I I think that is that is the case, and um, that. But I do think that the FSA guidance um, from 2019 asking clinics to get patients to sign informed consent or, or to do informed consent um, has probably um, made quite a big difference to information being given to patients and um, improving, um, well, I guess time, we, we don't have any time data on that, but I, I get the, uh, you know, and certainly in the, the clinic that I work in, that's in New Zealand that that's made had quite a big impact on the way we do um, offer add-ons. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions uh, from an attendee is actually about we showed some amber and red um, traffic lights from um, the UK model. Was there any green mm. lights for add-ons in the UK um, traffic light system? No, well, no, there weren't, <laughs> which is quite remarkable. But they haven't, hmm. that, that, it's not a comprehensive list, uh, Sarah, I can't remember the exact number, but I, you know, there are topics that are not on their, um, their list. Uh, and I think they've focused perhaps on the areas where there was real uncertainty, but no, that there, there's no, 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 uh, no greens yet. Mm. No greens, thank you. Um, well, I might throw back to you, Peter, about, um, you know, how can you offer test drugs procedures if they haven't been rig rigorously tested to show they're safe and effective? You know, you're, I hear stories where people say, um, clinicians have said to me, well, you know, the, the um, patient wanted it, the patient put pressure on me to offer the add-on. Um, so, you know, how do you feel as a clinician, you know, and, how, and does this... Um, happen in other areas of medicine where the patients are putting pressure on the clinician to offer an, ad hoc, an added therapy that has not perhaps been appropriately tested through randomised control studies? Yeah, look, um, a good question. I, I think with um, the Dr Google and all the uh, internet access that we have today, um, doctors continually find themselves under pressure from patients. Um, however, the majority um, of doctors tend to practice evidence-based medicine. And what we're seeing here with the explosion of add-ons um, in the fertility industry is that, um, as we've seen from the presentation tonight, um, that evidence base isn't there. Um, certainly there are add-ons in other areas of medicine, um, something simple, let's say blood pressure. You know, you may be on a, um, a beta agonist to control your blood pressure, but it's not quite under control. So your doctor may add in a diuretic just to bring things down to the desired level. But both those drugs have been widely researched and shown to be effective in the treatment of blood pressure. And what we're seeing here as from the presentation, the, the, uh, a lot of the treatments presented here um, don't have that evidence. And I think Cindy summed it up a minute ago, answering the question that there are no green lights um, in the HFEA. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Cindy, if I can ask you a, a question, well, is there any evidence of benefits from um, the Bondi protocol, which I believe is Clexane, Predisolone um, in the mix for the Bondi protocol? Uh, the, the Bondi protocol for recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, I might understand there are no randomised control trials. Uh, and um, in fact, we're looking at something a little bit similar for recurrent implantation failure, uh, 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 which is known as the Colorado Protocol. Mm. We are um, planning a randomized control on that, and that is aspirin, antibiotics, and um, steroids, and um, uh, uh, looking at that combination. So my understanding is neither of those protocols, which are quite similar, um, uh, have, any, have been shown to have any benefit, even in non-randomized um, studies. Mm. Great, thank you. Sarah, I um, thought I'd throw one open to you. Are there any current IVF add-ons that have proven to be quite complementary to IVF in, in the research you've done? Oh, thanks, Anna. Um, I don't know about 
the word proven, but um, some add-ons do have uh, some evidence that they they might help people to have a baby from IVF. So we, um, Cindy talked about um, embryo glue and based on quite a number of RCTs um, collectively looked at in, in the Cochrane Review on that topic, it does look like embryo glue um, probably increases the chance of having a baby from IVF. There's two other add-ons that have sort of similar conclusions from, um, from Cochrane Reviews uh, and those are assisted hatching of embryos and the use of um, androgen supplementation. But again, um, you'd have to look more carefully at the reviews in terms of um, the populations of women that, that they were tested on just to make sure that that applies. All right, thank you. I might throw one open to the whole panel. Uh, we've been asked, um, it says, uh, you, you haven't included risk to the newborn. So specifically with the PGTA, does it possibly reduce chromosomal abnormalities in newborns? Peter, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> well, um, yes, yeah, successful PG um, um, TA, um, if it um, does detect uh, uh, an aneuploidy and um, the embryo isn't transferred, then obviously the, the risk of um, a baby being born with that aneuploidy is reduced. Um, however, you know, there are, um, you know, risks with the procedure, um, you know, uh, mosaicism, for example, um, means that we may not get the correct result. Um, the embryos uh, have been biopsied. So in fact, um, you know, that will not uh, mean that all embryos will survive the procedure. So I think its use is, is rather than just routine mass screening is probably, um, you know, more key to if we're looking for a specific problem so that it doesn't get passed on. And uh, certainly that's the only context in which I used to use it. Thanks, thanks, Peter. I've got another um, great question. It's actually uh, a person wants to freeze their eggs and uh, they're finding it difficult finding concrete evidence for the success rate of live births from women freezing their eggs um, versus um, freezing an embryo. So, you know, um, fertilizing the egg and then freezing it. So. Is there um, some head-to-head -head studies on, um, you know, the various uh, success rates of the success rate of just egg alone freezing or the embryo frozen and then the live birth rate? So, no, as far as I'm aware, there are no head-to-head -head studies because I think um, they're pretty hard studies to do. We have, uh, um, we, we've got so much experience with embryos and, that egg freezing is a, is a newer technique, which is generally for women who don't have, um, I don't know how to put this, a partner yet, or, a, or they're having them frozen because they've got cancer and they don't have, um, uh, they're, 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 they're there um, in storage waiting for um, a, a, a sperm, <laughs> uh, uh, whereas, um, and that they, and, um, Storing eggs is, is still a relatively new technique. Uh, and so there aren't that many big series that have been published about how successful it is. Um, and Peter might have more to add to that, but that's certainly our own um, experience with, um, with egg freezing is that we're still um, you know, in a relatively new phase uh, around those. Not to say that it shouldn't necessarily be done, but I think people have to actually understand that it's it's not called experimental anymore, but it's still um, relatively new compared to the great experience we've got with um, embryos. Yes, right. Yeah, I, I'd just like to echo um, Cindy's comments. And I think the key word there was um, experimental. If we went back 10 years, the success rate with freezing um, oocytes was you know, virtually non-existent. And at that stage, it was experimental. Clinically, we no, no longer are classified as experimental uh, because the success rate is um, much higher. It certainly isn't as high as an embryo. So an embryo's chance of surviving a freeze fall process is greater than an oocyte. Um, but I think there, um, there aren't any head-to-head -head studies, but there is now um, a significant wealth of data out there uh, on um, re pregnancies resulting from uh, frozen oocytes. And again, it depends on the techniques used for freezing and a number of other factors. 
Great. Um, uh, one of the questions we've received is actually, um, they believe a lot of the research is focused on IVF in heterosexual couples. And um, they just wondered if there was any examination of IVF and add-ons in same-sex couples and if there's a difference in outcome or, um, or based on obviously our education session on randomized controlled trials, is there enough same-sex couples in the mix in the 1500 in your cohort, Sarah and Cindy? Mm. <laughs> um, I think I would just probably say, um, yeah, they, we don't tend to make too much of a distinction of um, between same sex and heterosexual couples in terms of evaluating um, add ons or other treatment options because um, we are going to need an egg and a sperm. Um, so even if there's a same sex couple, there will be a um, sperm present, and then together um, there might be an assessment done of whether. Um, there's any infertility problem um, between the two people supplying the gametes and so we, you know in that case we might um, we would still include those people in in our research studies and other um, surveys and I don't think there's any reason to think that uh, the evidence that applies for add-ons would not apply to same-sex couples I don't know if you'd disagree Cindy or Peter no, I think you put that quite well thank you Sarah yep mm. I agree um, some of the add-ons that are included in the standard fees for IVF at clinics, like is there then some sort of, um, is it inferred then by that clinic that that means they're proven to be safe and effective? Well, oh, I, I mean, we, uh, be... yeah, go ahead. Mm. No, sorry, Cindy, you go. Oh, well, I was going to say, for example, we include um, embryo glue as, our, as part of our every, every cycle no additional charge and it's absorbed into the overall um, cost of the IVF cycle. But, you know, if we did, did that a lot, it would gradually increase um, the, the cost for everybody. But we think that it's, um, that that's the right thing to do is, is offer it to everybody. Uh, now we don't have time lapse and I would, I would like to, uh, you know, I think our, well, our laboratory staff think it's, it's a good um, way of streamlining this, the, the laboratory processes and uh, has some other benefits there. And if we do, I would like to hope that we wouldn't have to charge for it, that that would be absorbed into the overall um, budget of the clinics. Um, that might be uh, a, a, an aspirational <laughs> approach that we may not be able to afford, but that, that's where we're up to at the moment. I don't know, Peter, whether you want to comment on other um, add-ons that um, uh, could be absorbed into clinics? Uh, yeah, no, um, I agree. I think it's up to the independent, um, you know, the separate IVF uh, units. Um, certainly the embryo scope, I know the, the embryo uh, embryologists like it because it is um, fairly time effective for them uh, because they're not removing embryos in and out of incubators. So again, it's reducing the risk to a mishap in the lab uh, it's reducing changes in temperature and gases uh, mm. for the embryo. So there are lots of bonuses there, but, you know, I think the last time uh, I looked at it, I think there are over 100,000 machines or something. So obviously the costs do come into it. So you have to weigh, you know, the processes of the laboratory uh, against the, the benefits of the patient. All right, we, we might ask one more question and then I think we're gonna to have to wrap up. It's actually quite a lot of interest around the traffic light system. So the question was, if there were nine studies that showed that an add-on increased your chances of having a baby, but then only one said there was no improvement, would that then give rise to an amber? Or because there's um, a difference in opinion, but you know, there's a weight of nine studies versus one study? Hmm. Yep, good question. And um, Sarah, uh, Sarah and I know one of the um, uh, biostatisticians who helped um, develop the system and, and uh, has made those colors. <laughs> uh, and um, it's not entirely clear, Sarah, is it, whether, for example, embryo glue is an example where they've given it an amber, but, he, but, but they have explained that's because some of the studies um, uh, showed uh, an improvement in live birth while others um, didn't report live birth. Sarah, do you want to say anything about yeah, that? Yeah, I the, think all I would add, 
yeah, on that, an embryo glue is a good example, I think, is that the the traffic light system, well, it, it's, it will be interesting to see what people think about it when we test it, but um, because it's so simple and it condenses, you know, it can only condense the evidence down into three colors, it's a bit crude in that sense. And so as, as I understand it, according to the system, yeah, if there's any conflicting evidence from randomized controlled trials, as long as the, the randomized controlled trials appear to be of sufficient quality, then yes, if one, if there's um, a majority of studies showing benefit, but one study showing um, no effect or, or um, harm, that it would get rated as conflicting um, because they've only got three options to choose from. So that's something that we want to consider when we roll out something in Australia of whether we need a more granular system of sort of conveying the evidence so that people can tease apart those sorts of distinctions. But if you are interested in how they arrived at that exact traffic light rating for each of the add-ons, you can um, find the meeting minutes. I think it's called the SCAAC meeting where they decided what um, color to assign the add-on and you can kind of go through the meeting minutes to work out um, what are the underlying studies and what is the evidence base there if you're interested. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you so much. Look, I know that there are more questions and, and I feel terrible that we can't keep going, um, but we do need to bring it to a close. Um, so before we close, I definitely want to absolutely thank our um, presenters, uh, Cindy and Sarah, and also I'm um, joining our panel, Peter, which was fabulous. Thank you for your time and your expertise. Um, the recording of the webinar will be available on BARDA's website. We um, would like the participants, if you could spare some time, we would like to send a short feedback survey following this um, webinar tonight. It will pop up in your browser or on your device. We would really like some feedback because it actually helps us to determine whether this is worthwhile to you. And also we would like to know if you'd like some similar education about other topics in the future. Um, and then that brings our webinar to a close. So thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Good night.